This is a story from Angela, and there are many like Angela living in the UK. This video is not about bashing and trashing the NHS. However, sometimes we need to look at the things that aren't working in order to fix them, improve them and make them better. There are many truly amazing people working in healthcare and the NHS, the National Health Service. Doctors, nurses, porters, cleaners, chefs, and the list goes on. A few in the health services are paid a very good salary for the work they do and they deserve it. They've forgotten family and free time. The hours are long, the work is tough, but for many, the financial reward isn't great, but the feeling of helping and being of service is. For many, that's why they entered healthcare in the first place. That's their motivation and their calling. If the motivation is for money, then those who think like that are in the wrong job. Anyway, here's Angela's story. Angela could feel it coming over her like a black cloud. Depression. Yeah, she wouldn't wish it on her worst enemy. She didn't want to talk to her partner. They'd been together for years, but she couldn't share this with him. She'd seen the look on his face when he came through the door many times and he saw that she'd been crying. She tried hard to disguise it, but after many years he knew her. He knew she was faking a smile and it made him depressed to see her like it. She couldn't bear to see him depressed and sad. She loved him and she'd even asked him to leave her. Not because she wanted him to go, but because she didn't want him to live with her and her depression. He deserved better. She'd been doing well, she could feel she had, but things had gotten on top of her recently. She tried to do it alone, but she needed help. There was the threat of losing the small amount of universal credit income if she didn't go to work or look for work, and then they would both be living on the street in their 60s. Didn't the authorities understand that they'd made things worse, threatening sanctions? Angela had seen the adverts for talking therapy. Yes, that sounded like the solution. She finally plucked up the courage to call the number and was told that someone would call her. She panicked. Please, can't I see someone face to face? She pleaded. They'd agreed. So she set off for the appointment on foot. The walk would help her to clear her head. She arrived not knowing what to expect, but this was therapy. She could talk and say how she was feeling. She could offload and get things off her chest before the kettle burst its lid. The building was new, concrete and cold. Not physically cold, but there were no plants or pictures just a huge empty waiting area like a doctor's surgery in a row of seats. Angela felt uncomfortable. She contemplated getting up and leaving. She shouldn't have come. Suddenly a door opened and her name was called. She had no choice now. She had to go ahead with it. She was led to a small meeting room with a desk and chair, obviously for the therapist, and another chair, which she correctly assumed was for herself. There was no natural light and the room resembled more of a prison cell than a therapist's office. Angela felt claustrophobic. She wanted to get it over and done with quickly. The therapist asked her some questions and said they were for assessment purposes. It was a form which needed to be completed. There were the usual questions, name, address, date of birth, and then questions such as, have you felt depressed this week? How many times would you say, and on a scale of one to ten? Angela started to open herself up and talk about how she felt, what she'd been through. Painful memories came up and she started to cry. After a little while, the therapist said, you can have a chance to speak later, but for now, let's carry on with the questions, as I'm aware of the time. Angela felt deflated and started to cry some more. She really felt she'd hit rock bottom and started to say how she was feeling and what she had experienced to make her feel that way. The therapist said, 
we only have 10 minutes left and I really need to get this form filled out and these questions completed. So um, have you had any thoughts about ending your life this week? How many times? Angela thought to herself, if I didn't have any of those thoughts before, I certainly might now. She thanked the therapist for listening and left hurriedly, thinking maybe there were other people waiting and that was why the appointment was rushed. When she reached the auditorium-style waiting room, she found it totally empty. Nobody was waiting. She hurriedly pushed the button to release the door to get out into the street so she could breathe fresh air. She looked up and that's when God showed up. She saw a picture of two television presenters in her mind. They were Alex and Richard from the show called Pointless. She smiled to herself. Never let it be said that God doesn't have a sense of humour. As she walked back to her partner, she began to think of ways to turn it round, to turn the negative situation into a positive one. Then she had an idea. She was learning. There was room for both the Mother Teresa type people and Beth Dutton type people in the world, and she admired them both. She could learn from both of them. If we look at what happened with Angela and her therapist, we can see that it was a failure. There's no blame or judgment here at all. The therapist most probably was under pressure to get the questions and forms filled in because the supervisor or boss of her boss had demanded them. And Angela, rightly or wrongly, assumed that talking therapy meant she could talk and feel better. The NHS wants the statistics and that's the problem. People are not statistics. They're not numbers and percentages. They're people, human beings. We all deserve to be heard, especially if we need help. Talking therapy is just that. Therapy where you talk. It's a connection between the therapist and the patient. The patient offloads and talks about their problems and the therapist listens and takes notes and then the roles are reversed. The therapist talks, advises and tries to help and the patient listens and learns. How can a therapist help a patient if they don't listen to them? Because if they don't listen, then they won't learn. For those that are able to change NHS procedures, talk therapy over the telephone doesn't work. It doesn't work over Zoom calls either. It needs to be face to face, just like a sponsor in NA or NA meetings. Therapists don't know what the patient's problem is and seeing the patient physically will help them as well as the patient. Please remember you're dealing with people who have had trauma maybe from abuse, from financial worries and stress, from losing loved ones, from domestic violence and bullying, or from addiction, and maybe from just sheer loneliness. The patient has taken a brave step by coming to therapy. It means they have something to say and they need help. Please allow the therapists to do their job and help. Qualifications and studying don't make a therapist. The best therapists are those that have had depression, ADHD, trauma, addictions, PTSD, anxiety, abuse, bullying, etc, etc. They know the problem since they've had it themselves. Compassion, empathy, understanding, patience, kindness and the ability to make someone smile are the key qualifications for a therapist, not degrees with letters before or after a name. The environment is also important. Some uncomfortable things are going to come up for the patient, so it's important to make the surroundings as comfortable as possible. A sofa to sit on, perhaps offer a cup of tea or coffee. Make sure the room has natural light and is inviting, cosy and calming. The therapist also needs to work in these surroundings, so the nicer the surroundings, the more pleasant it is for the therapist too. The NHS is in the business of healing people, both physically and mentally. So let's cooperate, work together and get the job done. There is life after lockdown. 
As Red said in The Shawshank Redemption, get busy living or get busy dying. That's the choice.